Adam, how did your latest sourdough deep dive go? Better? Um, yeah, I'd say better in some respects. So, yeah, so first of all, thanks to your personal input, David, and all the things that I've been learning just producing the show and listening, mm-hmm. I finally, finally got a starter ready to bake with. Uh-huh. So, thank you for that. You're welcome. So, Saturday, I began with the dough, put the dough in the fridge overnight, and then finished up on Sunday. Overall, I'm happy. I did have some problems, I will say, but the end result was bread, and it tasted great. Mm-hmm. I mean, it came out a little on the dark side, a little burnt. Mm. Was it burnt on the bottom? N- no, it's burnt everywhere. <laughs> uh. Yeah. But... I mean, it's not inedible, you know, and overall, I'm really happy. You know, I learned a ton just going through the process, and that's really Mm -hmm. where I get to learn, you know, when I try something out and I make some mistakes. So, I mean, yeah, overall, good experience, and I'm really excited to give it another try real soon. Well, and David is good at jumping in with that personal input. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, I I put my hand in here. I put my hand in there, just like Miss <laughs> Dolly Levi and Hello Dolly. How did the kids like the bread, Adam? Well, you know, my son, he's a picky eater, so he's not going to go anywhere near it anytime <laughs> soon. Uh, but my daughter, she likes it, you know. And actually, I have been making bread uh, using the recipe that I picked up again from the show Uh, the Mm five-minute no-need recipe from Zoe Francois. Mm -hmm. And I've been making that dough with my kids, and it's been a lot of fun, you know, been able to teach them something new, you know, get them excited about something that's not an iPad, you know? Science, homeschooling. Yeah, that's right, you know, making natural organisms. So that's science, natural organisms. Excuse me! Orgasms. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Natural natural orgasms. No, the natural organisms. I am so red. You are red. Oh, my God. Pick up line one. HR. Oh, my God. Pick up line one. I've never seen you so red in the face, David. (laughs) (laughs) And moving on, I'm Renee Shetler, editor-in-chief of Leeds Culinaria. And I'm David Leet. It's very embarrassed founder. (laughs) And this is talking with... With my mouth full. You really read, David. Adam, you're in luck because today we have one of the giants of the bread world, Andrew Jenjigian. Andrew is resident breadhead over at Cook's Illustrated and America's Test Kitchen. And I wonder if he is a senior. Breadhead, does that make him a head breadhead? <laughs> about that. And, and he's going to answer all your nagging questions about sourdough. So, Andrew, welcome to the show. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Nice to be here. So, I'd like to help get tons of our readers and listeners off the cross because some of them are just beating themselves up when it comes to sourdough. So, doesn't learning to make a great loaf of sourdough bread take time and practice? Absolutely. I, I'm still getting the hang of it myself, and I've been doing it now for 10 years or so. It, it takes mm-hmm. time, but you can get something that's quite edible and quite tasty pretty early on. So you shouldn't let um, aesthetics discourage you from continuing a lifetime of baking sourdough bread. Nice. Thank you. Thank you for saying that. <laughs> it really is just aesthetics in the, in the early days. That are the I problems, agree. For the most part. So we've been getting questions from readers that take us all the way from starter to finished loaf, cooling on the counter. So many questions when it comes to sourdough, especially, obviously, since we're not using yeast like most of us grew up baking with. Mm -hmm. So can you kind of talk us through, beginning from what is a starter and how do you begin to create that? What's your formula? What's your timeline? Okay, so... um to, to begin with, what a sourdough starter is a mixture of flour and water along with uh, bacteria and yeast that live in um, symbiotic association with one another. They consume the, sh- uh, the sugars that are uh, made from the starches in the flour. And mm-hmm. as they consume that, they uh, release all kinds of interesting compounds, uh, primarily carbon dioxide, which is what leavens bread, but also mm-hmm. flavorful molecules like acids, 
aldehydes and uh, alcohols, and that's where all of the flavor from bread comes from after the uh, the flour itself. Mm-hmm. And um, so the way you get a sourdough starter is you find a friend who has one and you ask them if they can you can give them some of uh, right. you can get some of that's theirs. Nice. <laughs> that's the easy way. Um, that's the easiest way, and and also the most reliable way uh, of getting it. If you don't have a friend with a sourdough starter, then what you do is you get flour, and uh, everyone has water. So you get flour, and you mix flour and water together, and then you simply let it sit for um, anywhere from 24 to 72 hours, Mm -hmm. and after which it will start to um, show activity in the form of bubbles and um, aroma, and that's a sign that the, um, that the microorganisms that are naturally present on a kernel of wheat or rye um, have woken up and are starting to consume that, um, the starches a- again. Um, the, these, the, the sourdough organisms are in nature. That's the, the only reason we can bake bread with them is because they're out in nature consuming sugars where they can find them. And um, one source of, of those are um, grains. And what is your formula, water to flour? What kind of flour and what's the proportions? So there's two ways to talk about it. One is, are we talking about quarantine conditions or ideal conditions? <laughs> ideal conditions. Fair question. You would want ideally organic flour so that you don't have any issues with fungicides or any anything else that might have been sprayed on the grain to kill mm-hmm. organisms. Um, mm-hmm. And you, um, you would ideally also have a whole grain flour in the mix, if not entirely all whole grain, because the, um, cause the whole grain is the, literally that. It's the whole grain. And so um, the, the organisms that are there in nature are on, on the outside of the grain, on the bran, the, the uh, seed coat. And so if that's been taken away, you're also taking away some of those sourdough organisms. So ideally, you have some kind of whole grain in the mix. Um, I recommend people do a 50-50 mix of white flour and rye or whole wheat. Rye is particularly good at, um, at being a place to find the organism. So that's kind of my, if I, if I could choose whatever flours, I would say a mix of all-purpose or bread flour and uh, rye flour. And then an equal amount of water to match the amount yeah, of flour. Yeah, the, the sort of ratios aren't as important in um, in the sourdough creation process as they are, obviously, in baking bread. You know, formula, it, it has to be pre- precise when you're trying to make a loaf of bread. But mm-hmm. when you're making a starter, it really just has to be kind of loose enough so that the um, the organisms have all the water they need. And so I, I, an equal parts mix is just as easy um, kind of thing to remember. You don't have to think about nice. w- what ratios because it's just the right. same amount by weight of each. So many people have written in saying that their starter goes gangbusters, like day two, day three, day four, and then it rolls over and plays dead. What's going on? <clears throat> and I got the same sort of things I, from people um, throughout this process that I've been doing myself. What's happening there is that, in fact, it's not simply that a kernel of wheat happens to have the two organisms we want, the lactic acid bacteria and the yeast that we want um, to leaven bread. They have all sorts of other microorganisms on them as well. And some of those are much faster to kind of uh, wake Ah. up. And, that makes sense. And in ecology, it's called a succession. You, ha- you start with a certain or- organisms that kind of take a foothold on in the environment. And mm-hmm. over time, as the conditions change, then those organisms die back and new ones replace them. And so the, it takes a while to get to the point where the yeast and bacteria mm-hmm. that you want are actually there in sufficient numbers to leaven bread. And so there is that middle period where it looks really good. People are just astounded that on day two, it's like doubled in size and it smells, right. it smells, it doesn't necessarily smell good in the early days, uh, which, which is something that is good to realize that like, actually if it starts out smelling kind of putrid and then it dies back, it's a good sign that you're getting away from those things that you really don't want to be cultivating. So it's like Game of Thrones of it bacteria. Is. It, 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 right. it is. There's definitely evolution involved, and there's definitely a competition there. And um, fortunately, the sourdough seems to win out in the long run. And mayhem and malevolence. 
<laughs> and so in terms of testing for doneness, I've been hearing a lot about the float test mm. in which you take a yeah. small blob of dough and drop it in a glass of water. And theoretically, when it floats, it's ready. Is that true? Yeah, so there's so unfortunately the the best way to know if it's ready is to make a try to make a loaf of bread with it. And mm -hmm. that can be mm -hmm. kind of disheartening when you've gone through a two-day process and you realize that you weren't quite there yet. But there are a number of sort of indicators that things are are either there or close to being there. And so a starter, um, a sort of, it's maybe it's more, it's easier to say what a mature starter looks like. Um, okay. it, you will, you'll mix it with uh, fresh flour and water and let it sit at room temperature. And within eight to 12 hours, it should about triple in volume. So it should wow. expand and it should happen fairly quickly. So in less than 12 hours. So probably not ready for prime time. Um, okay. So in the early stages of the process, uh, it, once it starts to pick up again after that kind of quiet period after four or five days, so maybe about seven to ten days in, it'll start to expand, but it will take longer than the 12 hours. So usually in the beginning, you feed it once every 24 hours so that like it can kind of go through the whole cycle and then it is time to refresh it. And so then when you're refreshing it, when you're not imminently baking a loaf of bread or intending to, right? Mm. Barring any spur of the moment needs for a loaf. How often do you feed it then? So yeah, so once a day is what I tell people. Um, you know, in the, we're, we're still talking about the creation process, right? Yeah. 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 So so here's what it looks like um, from day, say, one to about 10, you're doing it once a day. And hopefully by day 10, it's starting to move more quickly and starting to rise in less than, in about 12 hours time or so. And then you mm -hmm. can jump to twice a day feedings. And then eventually, say by day 20 to 30, some people in my kind of worldwide experiment have found it took up 45 days or so. So it can take a while. And wow. some of that has to do with the you know, how precise you're being or how, how, how uh, careful you are about feeding it on a regular schedule. And we can't, I can't control what other people are doing. So I don't know if those mm -hmm. like kind of outliers are because of the process or because of the person doing it. Mm -hmm. um, but so, you know, the, the entire thing should take about a month to get to a point where it can really leaven a loaf of bread um, kind of successfully regularly. Because what I've told readers is, I use a wet glass, those glass round yeah. glasses, right? Which I love, and I have them use a grease pencil or a um, a rubber band to mark where it starts, and then mark its high point. And then once it's rising and and, and collapsing and being fed and rising up again, that just before it reaches that high point, is that isn't that where it is its strongest when it's a uh, a fully mature yeah, starter? Yeah, absolutely. So that high water mark is the kind of ideal moment. Exactly. Um, it could be just below that. You can be about two thirds of the way through the process, and it's still going to be pretty good because it's it's mm -hmm. kind of got the forward motion still there. Um, yeah. So. Yes, but um, but there are plenty of bakers that use their starter, you know, after it's collapsed, and it's still it's still active and and definitely usable. You just mm -hmm. have to know better. It's, I think for a beginner, it's much easier to say, okay, I can see when it's at its peak exactly. or close to it, and and it's time to go. The longer you let a starter go, you know, you're talking about 30, 45 yeah. days, does that affect the resulting complexity of the flavor of the loaf of bread? Is that where you get that really sour tang, or is that Due to something completely no, the sourness is um, is has more to do with how uh, how you treat the starter and what you are feeding it or refreshing it with, and so the more whole grain that's in the mix, the more sour it's going to end up being. Um, wow. The uh, or you know if it's um, if you use warmer water or it's warmer conditions, then it will tend to be sour. There's a lot of different conflicting information about how you kind of push sourness. And like whether cold temperatures for the dough or for the the starter are better than warm for certain because there's different types of bacteria. There's lactic acid bacteria and acetic acid bacteria, and mm -hmm. each of those is a different compound. It gives you a different flavor profile, and some of them are more active at one temperature versus another. I like to have it pretty mild, 
Um, I mean, mm-hmm. my, my breads are, they have sourness to them, but I don't like that kind of punch you in the face sour <laughs> sourdough. I, and one thing I try to, when I teach baking and sourdough in particular, I have to always point out that sour, just because you're baking sourdough doesn't mean it will taste sour and it can actually be quite mild and, and it's not hard to make it taste mm-hmm. quite that's mild. That's a good distinction. Yeah, I mean, that's why bakers like to use the term naturally leavened as opposed to sourdough because it just mm-hmm. implies that you're mm-hmm. using a natural ferment, not, and sour is not in the equation right. necessarily. And I personally find it reassuring that you don't know the difference by heart of all those different lactobacilli, which means neither do I, nor ni- neither do I readers. And it's right? okay for us. No, and, and I, I, yeah, I, I mean, I have a background in, in microbiology too, and it, it's, <laughs> it's complex. It's not something, I mean, there are people, there are two labs now um, at Tufts. Uh, mm-hmm. My friend Ben Wolf has, has got a lab, and then one at, at UNC, I think, uh, or NC State, that are doing sourdough studies, and they're, they're learning things that people don't, haven't figured out yet. So there's still a lot to be learned about wow. sourdough. The science is complicated. In the proofing and fermentation stage, Some people have asked us, how come their sourdough sometimes doesn't rise in that initial proof? What's going on there? Well, so it it depends on whether or not, if your starter is active, or the word I like to use is mature. If your starter is mature and stable and does like reliably doubles to triples within 12 hours time, then probably the case that you didn't let it proof long enough in the first stage. If your starter is immature, then Mm -hmm. all bets are off. It's hard to say whether it was one or the other or both things going on. And so when people, I'm getting a lot of, you know, instant messages on Instagram with a picture of like what went wrong with my loaf. <laughs> sure. And Us there's too. nothing I kind of, I mean, I'm happy to help, but there's nothing I hate more than trying to diagnose bread from a single photograph over mm. the internet. But I guess in most cases in, right now, what I'm looking at are people whose starters aren't quite there yet. And so mm. they're, they're probably jumping the gun. They, they made it, they fed it and they were, you know, getting ready to put it into a, a dough to make a loaf of bread and they didn't proof it long enough in the first stage, and then once they made the dough, they probably didn't proof it long enough before they shaped it and then went to the next stage. And yeah. so that knowing what to look for is always the, the key. That's the kind of hardest thing to teach, but also the thing to try to teach people to think the most about. So, Andrew, what should we look for? What I tell people now is that the two stages of dough proofing are bulk fermentation and shape uh, proofing. So what happens before you shape the loaf and then what happens after. And what I suggest people look for, the kind of key indicators of a, of a well-proofed bulk dough is a kind of domed nature so the the dough i mean doubling mm-hmm. and all that stuff is important but really it should look like it's it should have a kind of curve to the edges so it should come oh, up in the center and curve to the sides of the bowl that's a sign mm-hmm. that it's it's got a lot of gas on the inside it should be kind of jiggly so if you shake it it should move really easily and mm-hmm. and then bubbles you should see kind of large and small bubbles in on the surface of the dough and then when you when you go to t- tip it out onto the counter or divide it up, you should see a fine network of, of bubbles on the inside of the dough. That's harder to see until you cut into it, but but you can right. kind of lift it up, or you can proof it in a glass bowl, and then it's obvious. It's right there. And so, really, once you see that, once somebody shows it to you, it's very clear what to what to look for. But I, I have a feeling a lot of people just, they see a recipe that says, oh, 8 to 12 hours, or however long the first proof, and they just I agree. set a timer and they move on, as opposed mm-hmm. to using their eyes and and noses as the the best judge of what what time it is. I think we're out of practice with that, right? We're out of yeah. practice with learning our grandma's side and what something should look like or feel like. Or yeah, smell absolutely. Like. Yeah, yeah, and I and I I always tell people that um, the bread itself is a kind of an, a living thing, but the mm-hmm. organisms that are in it are definitely living things, and you have to adjust to them, not try to get mm. them to adjust to you. Right. It's, um, I kind of call it microbial husbandry. So that you're, you're like, <laughs> you're, there, you're in charge of taking care of these organisms, and, and you have to know what they like and, and mm-hmm. adapt to I them. Love that. So Adam, you have a question, I think, that it fits in here nicely. Yeah. Hey, Andrew. Hey there. All right, so I have kids, and they're nuts. I know I'm not the only one in that situation, I know. You know, sourdough has a lot of steps that need to be completed within, you know, a certain window of time, right? 
Yes. So sometimes the day can get away from you, kids, life, etc. Right. This Saturday, for the first time, I baked a loaf of sourdough bread. And this is sort of the challenge that I encountered. Yep. So my question for you is, when things do get hectic, is it okay? And when is it okay to throw the dough into the fridge and sort of hit pause? And if it is okay, when you take the dough back out of the fridge, are there any additional steps that need to take place before you resume where you left off? Okay, so um, the beauty of refrigeration is that it makes baking and it makes sourdough baking, which is typically a kind of long process, uh, so much easier. And I, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of using the fridge, uh, particularly for a home baker. Bakeries have issues with space, so they can't always get everything into the, um, the refrigerator to do that kind of thing. But at home, it's really easy if you can just carve out a shelf or two from your mm-hmm. fridge. And so there's, two, there's a bunch of ways to do it. My current uh, approach now is to do the bulk fermentation at room temperature, and do the entire shaped proof in the fridge. So um, I do 12 hours at room temperature and then typically overnight. So I'll mix the dough around dinner time, and then the next morning it'll be ready to go and I'll shape it. And as long as it's at that kind of perfect stage that I just described, then you can go right into the fridge and leave it there for anywhere from 8 to 24 hours. I haven't actually pushed it, but I've heard people go as long as 48. And then Mm -hmm. the beauty of that process is as long as it lived outside of the fridge long enough and then it sits in the fridge long enough, you can go straight from the fridge to the oven. So it's very flexible. As soon as your Dutch oven is hot or however you're baking, you go straight into it. The beauty of that is not just convenience, it's also much easier to handle a cold dough because it's not, it's kind of stiffer, it's easier to score, it's easier to tip out of the basket, and it makes life so much easier. It took me a while to like get the hang of that. I used to do um, bulk fermentation half in the on the counter and half in the fridge and then take it out, shape it, and then have to proof it again to get it to the stage where it could be baked. And Mm -hmm. that can be really slow because if you take a cold dough out of the fridge, it can take a long time for it to wake up, particularly if it's like, you know, January and you keep your house at, you know, low 60s, then sourdough likes high 70s, ideally, for temperature-wise, if at room temperature. Well, and to your point earlier about people relying on time, if they make it in January as opposed to July, that's going to... Yeah, it's going to change it too. So you do bulk fermenting and the shaping at room temperature. Yes. Then sits in the fridge overnight. Yes. Or twenty four hours. Yeah, that's I what I do, do too. overnight. And it's really, it's I, when I figured out what it should look like, it changed my approach to baking. It changed my result. I think that you get better results. Um, you get better oven spring. You get better scoring. Mm-hmm. Uh, and mm-hmm. I, I've completely converted over to that way of doing things. Um, so yeah, it's definitely doable, even with kids. So there you go, Adam. Your kids ain't going to get in the way of you making good bread. <laughs> <laughs> They're not an excuse, at least. Yeah. There you go. So how do you get, this is about shaping. Yeah. How do you get beautiful buxom loaves so they're not sort of ovoid and kind of largest on the bottom, but they actually kind of rise up? How do you get that? So there are a couple of, of things that go into that happening. One, you need good mm-hmm. oven spring. So uh, we haven't talked about how to bake mm-hmm. or where to bake yet, but um, uh, you want to you know, ideally use a hot mm-hmm. baking stone or a, a Dutch oven if you're baking in a pot. I'm, I'm a big fan also of the Dutch oven. I think that for home bakers, if you're only making a single loaf at a time, Dutch oven is the best way to go. And so if you put that in the oven on the you know highest rack it can sit on with the lid on it and preheat it at 450 and and make sure it's good and hot when you put it in. So that's number one, because that'll give you that like energy into the loaf to get it to rise up as Mm -hmm. opposed to out. The other thing is uh, steam, because... You know, steam around a loaf of bread as it's the, in the initial stages of baking or keeps that crust moist, and so it allows it to expand maximally. If, like, you don't have some form of steam in the oven, then it'll set fairly quickly and it will be tight and dense. So a Dutch oven gives you that as well because w- with the cover on, the bread is producing its own steam, and there's only a couple of inches of space all around it, so it's easy to fill that space with, mm-hmm. to saturate it with moisture, and so that's another way to get um, to get it to rise up as much as possible. But there's another part of it, which is it happens earlier on, where shaping gives you the ability for that to expand kind of 
three dimensionally as opposed to right. two dimensionally out uh, in space. And so tension in a dough is important. And so the way you do that is. You know, something I've noticed a lot of kind of simplified bread recipes skip over the pre-shaping step, and I think that that's part of it too. So typically, a a, a bread a good bread recipe should have a pre-shaping step where you take the dough. If you have more than one loaf at a time's worth of dough, you divide it into pieces, and then you shape it into a round, and then you rest it for twenty minutes to a half an hour before you shape right. it a second time. And that pre-shape kind of evens out the texture of the dough. It knocks out any large gas bubbles, and it kind of mm-hmm. gets you part way to the finished shape without having to force the dough there prematurely. So it's sort of like gradually moving it from from a, a amorphous shape to a, a, a nice ordered one. And so that pre-shape is a good place for that tension to start uh, being built into the dough. And in the final shaping, it's really about like forming a good skin and not having the dough be sticky so it catches on the counter as you're rounding it or, or folding it. So you want to work with an adequate amount of flour. You also want to have a good formula. Like a formula is too wet, then it's going to be hard to build tension into the dough because it's going to stick mm-hmm. to your hands or the counter. And so a lot of it is just knowing how to shape. And then there's techniques for building tension into a dough. I don't know that we want to go into mm-hmm. that here, but really that is key. You want to like, you know, sometimes you blow up a balloon one too many times and it has that kind of, it'll have yeah. those weak spots in it. The skin of a, of a loaf of bread is like the rubber of a balloon. If it's nice and taut when you blow it up, it'll blow up in a symmetrical, uniform way. If it's got any weak spots, it's going to blow out. Or So building that tension is really okay. key. How does that tension in the loaf translate to holes? Mm-hmm. Because some readers tell us they're looking for really large, expanded holes and like Maybe not like so, ciabatta, like, yeah, but ciabatta. Well, yeah, I mean, there's kind of an Olympics of Absolutely. hole structure right now. I mean, everyone's competing. Absolutely, I'm, I, I think you know, I like um, I like peanut butter on my toast, <laughs> and so if the holes are too big and the peanut butter melts through, so I'm not. <laughs> I like a beautiful crumb structure, so but I, I don't think like it's the be all and end all. But in order to get that, you need um, you need a lot of water in the dough, which uh, for a beginning baker can be a difficult thing to handle because a, a, a high hydration dough is also yeah. going to be sticky, and so there are, there are ways of dealing with that. But that takes a certain amount of practice and skill to to master, and. You want that spring I was talking about before. Like the more the, the loaf can expand in the oven, the the f- kind of farther apart all of those alveoli are going to be. So you'll get bigger mm-hmm. crumb structure. Um, scoring it plays a part in in spring too. You have to score it well in order to get that to open up in a sort of mm-hmm. even way. And a very shallow, on an angle score, will give a big ear and also allow for. Yeah. A much larger opening. Exactly. Right? Yeah. So the goal is to kind of create a flap as opposed to a, a slit. So you're going mm-hmm. under the skin and, and creating something that is deep and has two sides to it that when they unfold, you'll get this large score. So typically, right. with a, if you're using a long curved uh, razor blade, um, you hold it so that that curve is almost facing the ceiling. That's what, you know, and it's something, right. it's not intuitive. You want it to face it up so that way that cut is really at a deep angle to the loaf. It's not okay. at all perpendicular. And then moving on to baking. Now, how do you prep the oven and do you use a pot? You like the Dutch ovens, right? Yeah, I mean, I actually did a post yesterday on Instagram about comparing the Dutch oven versus a stone and and what I consider the best possible way of steaming outside of a Dutch oven. And it was good. And, and unfortunately, what it showed was the Dutch oven was like a tiny bit superior. And mm-hmm. mostly because you get that kind of uh, shininess that uh, in the cuts that is really, I find really beautiful. It also, yes. is, it, it also it, the texture of the crust is a little more tender as a result of that. And that's because the steam is just better in a Dutch oven than, because home ovens are not designed to hold steam. They're leaky on purpose. They, they, right. um, so that you just can't get quite as much steam as you would. And also there's a lot more space to fill, so it requires a lot more water. And so the method I recommend to people who are baking on a stone is to use um, lava rocks in a pie plate, or mm. actually two pie plates um, mm-hmm. that you put in the bottom of the oven 
while you're preheating the stone. And when it comes time to bake, you leave the bread in the refrigerator and then you pour some boiling water onto one of the pans of lava rocks. And that kind of gets the oven saturated with moisture. Then you take the bread out, you score it, you, um, you put it into the oven and then you pour into the second pan and you kind of like give it another hit of steam. And that's where most of the steam is coming from, but that first uh, hit is there to kind of saturate the oven and ho- mm-hmm. hopefully to um, give you a little bit extra. Like a pie plate of lava rocks alone isn't as good as two. That blows my mind. I've never heard of lava rock. Yeah, I don't know where I picked up on it. I don't, I don't, somebody turned me on to it, but I definitely um, brought it to Cook's Illustrated, and it's now our go-to method. The, the two-pie plate nice. method is mine, and, and it's mm. a little too advanced, but like even just one pan of lava rocks is far superior to anything else. The ice cubes on a cast-iron skillet or right. spraying the sides of the oven are just not anywhere near as good as that. You, what you want to happen is to have steam be produced over that first 15, 20 minutes of the bake. And so ice cubes aren't going to, they're going to just cool down the pan and spraying yeah. the oven isn't going to last very long. And so you really need, I mean, if you if you ever watch how professional bakers bake, they have steam injectors and they run those things for the first 10 minutes of the bake. So they're getting yeah. plenty of steam there. And then so talking about the finished loaves, some people are saying, well, you know, my sourdough is just too dense. Mm-hmm. What caused that? So I would say that's that's kind of re- uh, reminiscent of those photographs that people send me. Dense suggests to me underproofing, whether it's a, because the loaf was not proofed long enough or because the starter wasn't mature enough, it's hard to say, but it's one mm-hmm. or the other of those things. One thing that people maybe don't understand is that... Um, that oven spring is actually part of fermentation. It's not. Mm-hmm. It's not um, just the water and the gases in the loaf expanding. The yeast is actually like having one last gasp, and so those first ten minutes or so, it's actually like cr- generating a lot of carbon dioxide. And so, if it's not active, oh. if it's under proof, then that's not going to happen, and you're going to end up with a dense loaf. And how about gummy loaves? I think that those two things go hand in hand because yeah. um, the moisture in the, the in the crumb either is going to escape from the outside of the loaf because it's ex- expanded and able to come out through the dough, or it's not going into the crumb as you know into the starches and fully setting because it's not it's not getting hot enough because it's so dense. It's really the moisture is never kind of going up to boiling temperatures. And so that's, I mean, I think there's gummy where people just cut into a loaf early. Um, that's the other true. things I, t- I tell people, you gotta wait. And I'm guilty of that. Yeah, we all are, <laughs> we all are. Uh, that's why I like to bake long loaves because the ends of the loaf mm. are ready, uh, they're ready sooner brilliant. than the center. Yeah, you know, round yeah, loaf, you don't have smart. the option, or, or at least you only have to, can shave off the first couple of inches. Andrew, thank you. I, I feel we've had an, a master's class in well, bread baking. Uh, My head hurts with all this information. I'm a little exhausted. You caught me at a moment where all this stuff is running through my head 24-7. Sure. So. It's fascinating. Thank you so much. Oh. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Andrew Jinjigian is a senior editor at Cook's Illustrated Magazine and America's Test Kitchen. He's also a baking instructor at King Arthur Flour in Norwich, Vermont, and elsewhere. You can find him online, of course, at cooksillustrated.com and on Twitter and Instagram. His handle is at wordloaf. Renee, this week... Lots of restaurants are opening all over the country. And while we don't have foot traffic like them, we do have specials like them. (laughs) Mind reciting them for us? Not at all. So we're a little all over the map this week. We start off with a Mapo tofu recipe from China. It's actually been the most popular recipe on our site so far this week. We also have a little different sort of chicken wings. Where we go to Mexico, we have a chipotle chili rub with a little brown sugar. It makes the wings sticky, sweet. And you roast them in the oven. There's no need to defuss with the deep frying. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. We also have a kimchi bulgogi sandwich. Oh, yes. Good. Right? Something different. Mm-hmm. You're going to get hooked on this, I promise. Okay. We do a homemade Greek yogurt. You can determine exactly the consistency that you want. We give you all the tips and tricks you want. Mm-hmm. We have soft peanut butter cookies, an original recipe from one of our recipe testers. 
Oh, wonderful. I'm so happy that's happening now. Yeah, we've got a lot of amazing home cooks contributing their stuff to our site. We're excited about that. And because it's Memorial Day, we've got smoker recipes. Oh, yeah, of course. Pork shoulder, brisket, a whole chicken, vegetables, everything. Mm. And then we cap it all off with a homemade rhubarb crisp, just like Grandma used to make. Oh, that's so seasonal. This weekend, we were at the store, and there was all this rhubarb, and I said, we've got to make something with rhubarb, so it's perfect. I know exactly what I'm going to make. Thank you, my dear. Well, there you go. This podcast is produced by Overt Studios, and our producer is our own doughboy, Adam Claremont. You can reach Adam and Overt Studios at overtstudios.com. Remember to subscribe to Talking With My Mouthful on your favorite platform and listen to us wherever you go. And if you like what you hear and want to support us, please leave a review and rating on iTunes. Ciao. Ciao.